It's been nice to spread people out. Very nice time. You know? I think we could have a party tonight at the end of service and say, you all want to have fun? Yeah. But you don't want to do that. That would take too much weight off you and you would have to take away from your life. Yeah, you pull down the strings, take the tape off. I'm going to tell them we're going to do a service project tonight. At that, if it takes that long, yeah, at that time. The ship is leaning more and more to the right every Sunday. It just keeps listing. <laughs> Is your hubby with you? The Braves, they all left. It's the what? It's the love of God. I'm doing all three verses and then the chorus. Okay, I can get that right. Well, good evening, folks. How in the world are you? Boy, I'm really glad these four came in because I was starting to list really bad. <laughs> Just kept falling off my stool up here, you know. So it's, it's good to see you tonight. Are you having a good day? How many of you enjoyed a Nazarene nap today? You know the worst thing to do in the world is to take a Nazarene nap when you're typing. It, it always happens that I have a finger on a key, and I've got like 40 or 50 pages of one letter. It's just wonderful. <laughs> you know? So uh, if you happen to get that email, it, sooner or later there's a message there. I, it's, it's there somewhere. But it is good to see you tonight. Hope you've had a good afternoon. And um, one quick announcement, and that is following service, we're going to do a service project. Would you mind doing a service project tonight? We're going to ask you to help us, so we're going to take down all these strings. Yeah, I think we're going to take down the strings. But now here's the catch. On the rows where there are, oh, look at her. She's cheating. She started early. <laughs> there's blue tape. There's blue tape. If you can just wad that up, make it into a ball and throw it at me, I'll pick it up. But in the rows where there are strings, there are also hymnals and Bibles. We've got to get those tucked back in. We're going to surprise Julie, and it'll all be done for this week. Uh, she doesn't know we're doing this, and, and my committee up here told me what I do, and I just do what I'm told. So that's what we're doing tonight. So we're going to do that at the end of the service, and, and I appreciate your help. If you can't stay and do that, I'm perfectly fine with you going out the door and feeling guilty for not helping. It's perfectly fine, but, but we'll get through it tonight. Who has something to praise the Lord for tonight? I need three praises before we can start the service officially. What, give, me, give me three praises. Taking the strings down, that's a praise. There's one, okay? Yes, sir. You found your lost billfold. Amen. Where was it? At home on the floor. That's good. In the saw. Now see, see, she took it. You had no reason to be in the sewing room. (laughs) 
Well, you know what? I'm glad you found it, Mary. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. I remembered, I remembered last night, of all the things to wake up in the middle of the night remembering, I remembered last night that last Sunday night you guys went to dinner after church. And I thought, I bet he left it at that restaurant. So at 2 o'clock this morning, you were keeping me awake. Just saying. So, but Well, that's two. We got two praises. We got, we got strings coming down, and we've got a billfold. Okay, we're going to wind up with four praises tonight. There you go. That is awesome. That, and you got to break bread. See? There you go. There you go, Carol. Wow. I need to know your friends. <laughs> you know, the, the, the coolest thing, our district superintendent and his son own a salmon fishing company in Bristol Bay, Alaska. And um, they leave this next week uh, to go up for the salmon run, the uh, sockeye salmon run. And David, Pastor Jim's son, in the midst of this business decided, you know, last year I caught 125,000 pounds of salmon and I only got to bring home 100 pounds of fillets because that's what you can ship home on the airline. So what did he do? He started a salmon import business. And so now they have somebody doing all of their fresh packaging up there in Bristol Bay. It'll be put on a freezer ship and taken to Seattle, put on freezer trucks and distributed four different spots across the United States. But you have not lived until you have fresh, I mean fresh, right out of the sea sockeye salmon. Debbie's never liked salmon until I brought some home from Pastor Jim a couple weeks ago. And um, man, it's good stuff. So if you're interested in fresh salmon, I know where you can get it. And the price is good, you know. Uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to scream a little. It's like 17 and a half a pound. But if you go to Wichita to the fish store in Wichita, it's $37 a pound there. So I think I can hook you up for a little less if you're interested in importing some salmon. But I need to know your friends. Smoked salmon is good. It's good. I really, I really admire Victor. Man, I just love this guy. Isn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? Shh. He doesn't want anybody to know he's over there. So we're going to ignore him. It'll be good. Number 86 in the hymnal is the love of God. And we're going to do it a little different tonight. We're going to sing all three verses. And then we're going to sing the refrain. Um, simply because the refrain goes a little bit higher than I think I'm going to get to tonight without air. So we're only going to sing it once. The love of God is greater far than time or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star, reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care, a baby son. I gotta stop for just a minute. I don't have that verse that's up there now, so I guess we're just gonna sing it. It's not in my notes, so here we go. When hoary time shall pass away, earthly thrones and kingdoms fall. When men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call. God's love so sure shall still endure a measureless and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, saints and angels song. Could we within the ocean feel and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe. 
by trade to write the love of God above would drain the old ocean dry. Now it's broken tin <coughs> to let you sky. because of God's amazing grace. Amazing. <laughs> okay, you know what just happened? We were planning this not to happen. I was supposed to remind Sharon. Debbie was supposed to remind. She gets to transpose on the organ, and so she transposed to play what Debbie was playing, and, and we were supposed to remind her to, uh, to switch it back. I think it's funny, because for once it wasn't I who messed up. <laughs> we'll try it again. Sweet the sound that saved a poor sinner like me. Oh, once I was lost, yet now I'm found. Though I was blinded, now I see. And it's all. shall see him face to face, all because of God's amazing grace. Who disappointment and danger to
pray a word with me. Father, how good it is to come into your presence tonight and just to be able to sing great hymns of the church and to be able to be together on this Sunday evening as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and friends, uh, one with another. Thanks, God, for being with us, uh, for your love and your presence that comes with us when we come to worship you and is present in us, God, as we worship. Help us tonight, Lord, to turn our hearts to you and to allow you, God, to speak to us and to say to us the things uh, that you want us to hear. A little later, we're going to talk about what's ahead and the promise of heaven. And I just pray, God, that tonight would be a night when we could just kind of get our faith uh, boosted a little bit. Father, there are lots of needs, and we just want to lift them to you tonight and just pray that your will would be done. I have a number of unspoken requests that have been shared with me, and God, you know every need that is there, and I am thankful that you are infinitely able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. You're the great physician. You're the encourager. You're the one who gives us strength. You're the healer. You're the forgiver of sins, the, the transformer of souls. You're the one who comes alongside when we're struggling and gives us peace. You're the one who walks with us when we feel alone. You're more than we could ever ask or imagine. And tonight, as we place all of our cares on you, we do so knowing, Lord, that because you care for us, we can rest. And we can know that your will will be done and your grace will be sufficient for our every need. Father, be with us as we continue to worship tonight. Bless in song and in the word and help us tonight just to celebrate one another in Jesus' name. Amen. I can hear my Savior call. I can hear my Savior call. I can hear my Savior call. Take thy cross and follow, follow.
and go with me, with me all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him. Had a friend call me this week, and uh, she's been in ministry at a local church for a number of years, and um, she has an amazing ministry. Uh, She works with kids. Uh, Before COVID, she had about 210 kids in her program in a church of 400. That'll tell you a little about the church. And um, post-COVID, she has now about 100 and. 30 or so kids, and God has just done some amazing things through her, and she called and she said, you know, Pastor John, um, I've never had to take the journey I'm on. She said, God has kind of told me I'm done where I am, and I don't know what to do, and um, as I was singing this song tonight, I'm going to have to call her back tonight and tell her, I, I got a word for you. But I said, you know, my experience has been, and it's only happened three times, that when you get to the place where you've done what you've been called to do, and it's time to take the next step, God always leads you. And I said, don't take the step until you know that 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 it's the step you're supposed to take. Some of us have been going through some interesting days. And it's like, God, what's next? Man, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. Some have been dealing with health issues and some have been dealing with family issues and And our church has all kinds of unique, I love this word, it has a plethora. It's a fun word to say, a plethora of stuff going on in people's lives. And it's like every day I keep saying to people over and over and over again, God knows where you are and he has a predictable path for you to walk on. But for it to be a predictable path, you have to lean into it. And let him lead you where he wants you to go. One thing makes that possible. I'm going to call and tell my friend that tonight. And that is when we submit our lives to his grace. I don't know what you did to deserve God's grace. But I didn't do a blessed thing. In fact, he had every reason to just walk away from me. 1700s, John Newton was a professional slave trader. He made a fortune off the lives of people he sold into servitude. He didn't care the cost, he didn't care the consequence, he didn't care what it might mean for them. But one day he heard a message that caused him for just a moment to think about what he'd been doing. And the more he thought about it, the more he realized how horrible a thing he was a part of. And he walked away from vast riches, a horrible enterprise and said, the only hope that I have is found in grace. I think I can safely say most of us love the song we're going to sing next. It's just a song that um, speaks of what we need the most. 
If you're comfortable sitting down, singing it, you can sit down. If you're comfortable standing up, singing it, you can stand up. However you want to sing it, I just want you to sing it with all you've got tonight, okay? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Lord, for your amazing grace and for all that it's done for us. Help us tonight as we look to your word. Draw us near to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to wind up tonight in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you want to look for that, it's pretty easy to find. Somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. In the latter third of the uh, Bible. And uh, it's an incredible, incredible book. Um, there's a song that I uh, like to sing once in a while. We don't sing it too often, but it's one that I just love to sing. I've loved during this time with John Away. I, I asked Sharon um, if she would just plan all of our evening services. And it's been really fun to have her plan the services because she's sensitive to my voice. And she keeps it a little lower registry for me and makes it a little bit more fun. 
Um, but there's a song that when we pastored in Kentucky, when this song got chosen to be sung, it was a song that just kind of brought the rafters down. And um, I had some great old holiness folk in my church in Greensburg. They were of the hanky waving variety. Uh, some of you don't have a clue what that is, but let me just tell you that when, um, let's get it here, when the hanky comes out and you shake it, because it can't be all folded up, and it comes up and it comes over and it comes up, God is about to do something amazing in the church. It's usually followed with... There we go, right there. Now, I was not blessed in my church to have any aisle runners. Man, oh man, down in Kentucky, they do it right. Debbie's in my first district event after we moved there in 1987 was to go to pastors and wives retreat. And we get to pastors and wives retreat. We're down at, where were we, Deb? What, what state park it was? I don't remember. But, but we were in this meeting room about two sections wide and there was a, a pulpit and one altar and um, folding chairs and a grand piano about right here close enough to the pulpit that if you got wound up preaching you were going to knock into the, into the piano and Miss Maddie Klein always played the piano and, and I'm not sure who was leading um worship that Sunday night, but we were singing the uh, national anthem of the Church of the Nazarene, which is, uh, what song? Come on. And can it be? That's one of the national anthems. Well, we, yeah, called unto holiness is like the, the summa cum laude. It's the high stuff. But the and can it be, we were just going nuts. And we, we're, we're about halfway through it. And we hear this sound, De Debbie and I, I've always been one of those guys who believes that you sit up front. If you're not getting any spit on you, you're not getting blessed. So you get up there in the spit zone. And um, thanks, Sharon, for being down close tonight. <laughs> Debbie has backslid over the years, but you notice I'm always down front on Sundays. But, but, but we always sat on, down front, and, and we're down like on the front row and we hear this sound behind it. I may have shared this before. We hear this, boop, boop, boop. And I mean, we're, we're, we're coming down through there. My chains fell off my heart. And then we hear this, boop, 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 boop. And all of a sudden, Pastor Melvin Wilkinson, who's a retired missionary, now pastoring, well, then pastoring, now he's in glory. But, but in those days, was pastoring in Western Kentucky. He takes off running. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but you can run the backs of Samsonite folding chairs. He did it. He just took off. And I mean, he's terrorizing from the front to the back and, and every step is boop, 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 and he's just going nuts. And then, not to be outdone, Jerry Klein, Maddie's husband, he takes off and he's in a full sprint going around the whole place, having an absolute ball. And, and then not to be outdone, David McCracken, he jumps up and he takes off. And he, when, he, when David takes off, you got to watch out because he gets everything going at once. He's got an arm swinging. He's got a hanky waving. He's got his knees coming up and he's screaming his full head off. And Debbie looks at me and she says, hey, Toto, I don't think we in Kansas anymore. <laughs> But inevitably, at pastors and wives retreat, and on a lot of Sunday nights, we sang a song. Its words say there's coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. 
What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and he leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Can you imagine it? I mean, just for a moment. Can you let God just transport you out of this sanctuary tonight to a place where there is no need of light for the Lord is there? Where the streets are of gold and the gates are of pearl where the angelic choristers are singing, worthy is the lamb. Where the joy that comes from knowing that because you gave your heart to Jesus, you forever will be with him. Can you imagine it tonight? I'm not sure what to look forward to most. An absence of clouds in the sky or tears in my eyes. An absence of sorrow or burdens or sickness or pain. Boy, that'd be a nice one to be rid of. An absence of sin that has destroyed the lives of so many. I'm not sure what I look forward to most. But I have this sneaky suspicion no matter what I look forward to, it's not going to matter when I get there. (laughs) Because what we experience when we get there will be so much more than anything else we could have thought. What a day, glorious day that will be. I've noticed over the years that when you talk about heaven, people get a little misty-eyed. You look them in the eye and they they get little smiles. They're starting to see. They're starting to experience. They're, They're starting to think about what's ahead. I've attended the deaths of I can't tell you how many saints in nearly 35 years of ministry. It's a hallowed moment to watch somebody cross over. (laughs) Wow. When this old world just passes away and they're ushered into the presence of Jesus. And nothing here matters anymore. I remember the day my dad like, died like it was like it was like right now. He had been failing fast and we knew it was his last day. And my mom and sisters and I were gathered in their bedroom and dad was cradled in my mom's arms and mom and dad were cradled in mine and my sisters were sitting on the edge of the bed. Everybody had a hold of dad somewhere. My dad had this grin on his face. He was seeing something we couldn't see. He looked at my mom and he, he said, honey, thank you for a beautiful life. I've got to go now. 
And that was it. He was in the presence of Jesus. <sighs> what a day. Glorious day. We've all lived with a lot of stuff. And when we start to think about that day, we all have these ideas of what heaven's going to be like. And I, I don't know what you think it's going to be like. There's, there's writers out there that's there that are, that are saying things like heaven's going to be earth, rediscovered with no sin, no Satan, no trials, no troubles, no difficulties. We're just going to be able to enjoy life the way it was meant to be. Personally, I hope that's not the case. Because you know what? There's so many things I've gone through in this world. I don't want to have to ever wonder or worry about them again. I hope it's all brand new. Man, what a day. Glorious day that'll be. Since I was 16 years old, I've dealt with chronic pain. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just my journey. I learned long ago that you don't need to complain about it because all you do is make other people miserable and they can't help you, so you might as well just shut up and deal with it yourself, you know? And so I just live. I look forward to a day when that'll be gone. What a day, <laughs> glorious day that'll be. I've held the hands of people whose lives have been broken and decimated by the sin of others. And they live broken because of it. And they dream of a day when the pain of heartache will be gone. What a day. Glorious day that will be. I've spent a lot of time with people who have struggled with addiction. There's some folks who think they just, they just need to get over it. I've been there. I've dealt with that. It's not that easy. But when we get there, that's the thing of the past. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica some interesting words. He says in chapter 4 and verse 13 of his first letter, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him or bring with him those who have fallen asleep. In Jesus, what a day, glorious day that'll be. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will be raised first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with him. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I'd love to see that day when we're caught up to be with Jesus in the air. I don't think we'll be singing this song, but I can imagine what it'd sound like if we were, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. One glad morning, <laughs> I'll fly away. Paul's trying to tell the church, we have something to look forward to. And that's good news. When you look at all of the suffering and the, the heartache and the brokenness of the world in which we live, it, 
it's good news to know that one day it'll all be over. And for those who have given their hearts to Jesus Christ, it will be a glad and glorious day. What a day. Glorious day that will be. What do we learn tonight in these words from Paul to the church at Thessalonica? I want to walk through these verses starting in verse 13. And I'm not going to say a lot, but I want to say a little. And maybe just encourage you on this Sunday evening as we think about what someday will be our future. Now, don't get any ideas. Tonight's not a good night to check it out. So, you know, you just, just don't, don't get ahead of yourself here. <laughs> in other words, hang around for a while. Um, I made a mistake when I came to Emporia and another one when I came to... Uh, Salina, when I went to my first church, I, I, I told the folks in Greensburg, Kentucky at the board meeting, I said, now I will make you a great pastor, but I don't do funerals so nobody can die. And for five years, not one blessed person did. Nobody died. I think they were mad at me. They wanted to go to heaven, but I wouldn't let them. I didn't, I didn't tell the board that when I went to Emporia and I backed the U-Haul truck into the driveway and the phone in the parsonage was, was ringing and I ran in the house and answered it and they said, are you the pastor? And I said, well, yeah, I'm the pastor. And they said, well, you've just had two of your members die. We need you at the hospital now. About 80 funerals later, from that church, the Lord let me come to Salina. I forgot to share, I don't do funerals here. And now 551 funerals later, since coming here 16 years ago, almost 100 in this church. I've got to take a lot of people to glory. It's been good. But I want to talk about it tonight. Give you a glimpse of what you have to look forward to. Verse 13. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. We have hope, folks. We have hope. Most of us in this room have seen at least one, if not both of our parents go on to glory. Some have probably had to admit that their parents, well, they're just not sure where they wound up. Some of us know beyond the shadow of a doubt there with Jesus. But we don't grieve today as people who don't have hope. We have hope. While we can't affect change for those who've gone on before, we can affect change for us. And tonight we have hope. We have hope. We don't have to wonder or worry or fret or stew or, 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 or try to figure out whether or not we're going to make it. We can know that we know that we know that we know that if we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, one glad morning, we will fly away. Hallelujah. What a day, glorious day that'll be. Verse 14, Paul writes, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We have hope. And that hope's built on what God has done for us in Christ. And, and tonight, we can just rest. If Jesus is in our hearts. Whether we are alive or dead at his second coming, we will be with him. That's good news. Man, that's good news. 
verse 15, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Christ's coming will be unmistakable. He's not going to sneak in the back door and say, gotcha. When he comes, everybody's going to know it. Can you imagine what that day's going to be like? Two are working in the field. One is left, the other taken. That, that, that passage has always scared the liver out of me. I don't want to be the one left. When he comes, it'll be unmistakable. But I want to remind you that when he comes, the decision will have already been made. Because I think the shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet blast of our God and the lightning that shines from the east into the west are going to be simultaneous events and our eternal lot will have been determined when they happen. We won't have a chance to say, time out, God. Give me just a few more moments here to fix all this. We're not going to have that. We're not going to be like the thief on the cross who is Jesus is, is physically bleeding out next to him, looks and says, remember me when you enter into your, your, your paradise and Jesus is able to respond. We can do that. We're not going to have that. You're ready or you're not. Whew. That's good news for those of us who knew Jesus. That's bad news if we don't. Verse 16, I want you to notice that last, last part, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Do you think those who are living are going to feel a little jealous? You know, as they get to watch all the saints who've gone on before just ascend to the throne of God, and they're sitting there saying, wait for me! <laughs> You know, I don't know. I don't know. But for those who have died in Christ, whose eternity is secure, in that moment, God will receive to himself his very own. What a day. Glorious day that will be. In verse 17 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. My dad told me a story when he was growing up. He lost his father to liver cancer as a result of alcoholism when he was 11 years old. And my dad went to work for his grandfather, my great-grandfather on the farm to help provide for his mother and his siblings. As the oldest child at age 11, he became the man of the house. And in those days, that meant you worked. He, he went to school, he, he finished high school, but, but he worked. Uh, Grandpa had had an old tractor. Everything was old back then. That's a long time ago. And he had gone out and he'd bought a new umbrella. And he'd put it on that tractor. They were getting ready for harvest. And Grandma and Grandpa went, went to town. And Dad got the bright idea that he wanted to fly. It's a little breezy out. So he took the umbrella and he crawled up into the hayloft and kind of stuck it out and opened it up and he held on real tight and he jumped thinking that he would go up but he came down and the umbrella didn't stay out it went up and well you know the whole story <laughs> he said I failed my first flying lesson He said, you know, a John Deere umbrella is pretty hard to flip back from inside out to right side in. 
And he said, Gra Grandpa never said anything, but he said, I knew he knew. Can you imagine what it's going to be like if we are alive at his coming again to suddenly be snatched from where we are and to meet him in the air? My, my, my imagination gets really fertile. Snatched out of the seat, driving down the highway. Who cares about what happens to my car? Snatched from behind my desk. That's a wood beam ceiling above my head. I hope it opens. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Rapture, we call it. <sighs> There's another little phrase in verse 17 I want to hit for just a moment. It's right at the very end. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. I did really well in math in high school. Um... I had a plan for my life that, 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 that included going into medicine and I had this dream of either being a cardiothoracic or a neurosurgeon and, and I knew that, that, that the schools that I was looking at were, were going to use math to weed out the students they didn't want in the program so I worked really hard to make sure that I could get it all figured out. And you know, one of the things I learned in math was that infinity cannot be qualified and neither can eternity it is an unknown integer I don't know how long forever is when it says we shall always be with the Lord I, I, I don't know how long always is either but it's longer than the 55 minutes we've been in church tonight. And we don't know how to understand it. But it's a long time. And then verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Don't dare miss the opportunity to look at the one who came with you or those seated by you and say tonight, that's what we got to look forward to. And if you're not ready, now's the time. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Now we're gonna do something that up to this point in the history of Christendom has never been done. Tonight, we are going to end one of the greatest theological debates of all time. It's built around two questions, and, and both of those questions we're going to answer tonight and do what nobody else has ever done. Here's the first question. When will this day, the day of his coming, happen? Jesus said, the day and the hour you know not when. So let's answer that question they still haven't figured out how to answer yet. It doesn't matter. Just be ready. Works for me. We just did what 2,000 years of history hadn't been able to do. Now, now here's the next one. This one's a little tougher. When will this day the day of his coming happen in relationship to the great tribulation. In other words, will we get taken out before it or will we have to go through it? Let me answer the question. It doesn't matter. Just be ready. Because whether we're here or there, Jesus is going to get us through it. 
when I was in seminary, they did things a little differently than they do now. Students who go through seminary today are, are wimps. Just going to say that. They have to take a final exam at the end. But no matter how they do on the exam, they still get to graduate. They might have a little work to do, but they get to graduate. In, in my day, about six months before graduation, they handed out to all senior students a notebook. 4,000 duplexed pages of everything you've learned since kindergarten. And they said, you will be responsible for every single part of it all the great theological debates, all the questions, the Greek, the Hebrew, you name it, it was in there. It was disgusting. You took a two-hour oral exam. Three professors each got two 20-minute rounds, and they could ask you anything from kindergarten to where you sat in seminary at that day, and how you answered determined whether or not you got your degree. They could take away... 93 hours of graduate work and not let you graduate if you didn't pass your orals. Being the brainiac that I am, not, I thought if I do orals first in the morning, they won't have anybody to compare me to. So the stuff I don't know, I'll be able to just get through. That's what I thought. I walked in and I sat down and Dr. Wes Tracy, who used to be editor of the Herald of Holiness and a great, great professor, looked at me and this is how he started my interview. He said, John, it is so good to welcome you today. You're going to have the temptation to baffle us with your bull. You better hope you can dazzle us with your brilliance just made me feel so good. He then looked at me and he said, John, now this is round one, the first 20 minutes. He says, John, uh, there's, there's just one question that I need answered and, and this will determine where I go with the rest of my round and the next round. I, I need you to describe for me your understanding of the doctrine of end times. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's a, a pretty controversial subject that I've boiled down to one term. And he goes, really? What's your term? I said, I'm a pan-millennialist. He looks at me and he goes, I'm not familiar with that. And he, he looked at his two colleagues and said to Dr. Weigelt, and I can't remember who my other one was, he said, uh, Gentlemen, you familiar with that term? Everybody shook their head no. And he said, John, you're going to have to enlighten us. And I said, well, it's, it's, it's really pretty simple. You can be a pre-millennialist and believe that the church is going to be raptured out before everything happens. You can be a post-millennialist and you can say, we're going to hang around for the worst of it. You can be an ah-millennialist and say that somewhere between day one and day a thousand, you're going to get out of here. Or you can be a pan-millennialist. And he goes, I don't follow. And I said, it's real simple. As long as you've got Jesus in your heart, everything's going to pan out in the end. And he looked at me and he goes, I have no more questions for you. And he was like, hallelujah. <laughs> one down, two to go. But there it is, folks. We waste so much time trying to figure out stuff that Jesus never intended for us to figure out. One day, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet blast of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain shall then be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. What a day. Glorious day. That will be. Now, 
Now, if this were Sunday night in Greensburg, Kentucky, sitting down about where Miss Sharon is, little Miss Margie would have her hanky out. She'd be doing this. She wasn't fanning herself. She just didn't have the energy to get it much higher. Over here, Miss Lottie would be weeping and sputtering, trying to shout but afraid to do so, and every once in a while, she'd let out a little squeal. It was kind of cool. Brother Root, one of my retired pastors, he was down here on the second row next to his, his granddaughter and her four kids. And he would sit there and he'd go, Oh, shucks. <laughs> oh, shucks. That's how he got blessed. And Brother Whitaker, Miss Margie's husband, uh, another retired pastor, he'd be down there and he wouldn't be saying much, but he'd have his finger up. And, and you knew he was trying to get something out, but he was just, I think he was scared to death to shout because he wouldn't be able to get it stopped if he did. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Verse 18 is probably the most significant for me tonight. Therefore, comfort one another with these words and encourage each other to be ready. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, oh, what a day, glorious day. God, help us to be faithful to see it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for hanging out tonight. Let's have fun de the church. <laughs>